I uh, just wanted to extend a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you to the Brin Prince George's Mon County uh, Municipal Association. <laughs> We're so delighted to be able to have a joint meeting with you. We know that when we can come together, we're stronger. And so um, I wanna welcome you all uh, here with us and uh, just um, wanted to note that we're gonna have some really great speakers today. And uh, before I do that, I wanted to uh, turn it over to my Prince George's colleague if you wanted to add anything before we do an overview. <laughs> this is M Mayor Penoyer, and I am absolutely thrilled that you, this is happening. I love the speakers. Mm -hmm. You guys did a wonderful job putting this together. Uh, I feel very close to Holly these days. <laughs> uh, thank you for having us, and I agree. We are much stronger together. I think we, we hold... Uh, quite the record for population between our two counties in, the, in this state. So, uh, and once again, thank you. We do, it, your list of uh, speakers was great. And I appreciate that. Topics we are all very concerned about. Uh, Wonderful. So I'll just ask everyone if you can go on mute. And uh, thank you, President Poynoyer and Mayor. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce our guest speakers today. We have Mark Stewart, who is the program manager of Climate Change Program. Uh, when we came together with our Prince George's colleagues, we wanted to discuss what were two big issues uh, that were impacting our area. And we had a, a number of things that came up, but we looked, we aligned on, on climate change and the environment, and then what's going on with redistricting, because uh, I know that's a hot topic as well. And we're so delighted to have Mark Stewart uh, for the Maryland Department of Environment. He's gonna give a quick presentation uh, and then we will have some chan uh, a chance to do a question and answer. Many of our municipalities are taking our own efforts to uh, do some you know, climate change planning. Uh, and then many of us are part of COG as well and also feed into the broader Montgomery County plan. We especially given some of the things of the recent past with Hurricane Ida, some of us experienced flooding in our communities and, and have had a direct impact as a result of climate change and we're wanting to do more to be leaders in the space. So we welcome Mark Stewart and then followed by Mark will be joined by uh, Dr. Kathleen Hetherington. She's the co-chair of the Maryland Citizens Redistricting Commission and she'll give a brief update on what's going on there and then we'll have a Q&A. And with that, uh, Mark, if you are ready. Sure, yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me. And um, I should say that I'm a, a resident of Montgomery County and a former resident of Prince George's County. Um, and before coming to MDE just three months ago to uh, uh, Secretary Grumbles appointed me to be the climate change program manager uh, just last summer. Uh, prior to that, I spent the last 14 years as the sustainability and climate change manager for the University of Maryland. Uh, and I see Mayor Wohan on the, the, on the line here. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a proud former College Park uh, resident and employee, uh, but have just recently shifted to, uh, to this state role. <laughs> um, uh, I am, um, you know, I want to talk for a little bit about primarily the, st the state's initiative through its Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve carbon sequestration statewide. Um, I'll also share with you some sort of emerging strategies that, um, that may be coming to the legislative session uh, in 2022. Um, and uh, it's, it's often that climate change is the controversial topic on an agenda um, uh, tonight, I think with redistricting, I, I, I might get the easy end of, <laughs> of the show. Uh, so uh, happy to happy to kick off what uh, what could be a, an action packed meeting for you. Um, so Maryland is already recognized as a leader on climate action, ranked number one by the World Resources Institute for reducing as as a state in the United States for reducing greenhouse gas emissions while growing its economy. But there's much work that's left to do uh, to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, to achieve the state's goals, and to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, climate change affects each of us in many different ways, 
Uh, my family happened to be um, displaced twice. They, they live in historic Elegant City and they, they were displaced by the 500 year storms that hit the, t the town and you know, just two years apart. Um, my, my, the second storm was actually too much for my sister. She decided to move to Maine after that one. Uh, and actually she, in part, she moved to Maine to escape the impacts of climate change. And I haven't had the heart to tell her that uh, the impact, the impacts of climate change will follow her to, to Maine as well. Um, our region uh, is, is being affected by climate change right now in a number of different ways. Storms are getting stronger and more frequent. Uh, an issue that many of you are are um, are unfortunately aware of uh, as as town managers, um, it's causing higher and higher loss of life and property almost annually. Marylanders currently experience about one week of extreme heat each summer. By the time I reach retirement age, that'll increase to one full month of extreme heat days per year. By the time my two children reach retirement age, the majority of Maryland summertime will be extreme heat days. The faster that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the better our future outlook, uh, our, our future projections look. Um, so action is important, but we also must recognize that a lot of this is baked in uh, to the, the climate system. Um, the planet will continue to warm for likely about 100 years uh, following uh, the, the end of our uh, release of, of uh, massive amounts of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So the, the climate will continue to change. We must uh, plan for, um, for that reality. Uh, and we must, of course, enact the measures that are necessary to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible and sequester as much uh, greenhouse gas emissions as we can. Um, I sleep a little better at night knowing that Maryland is in the company of many states and other nations that are working hard to address climate change. And, um, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of some of the key strategies in the state's greenhouse gas reduction plan. Um, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act is the state's law originally passed in 2009 uh, and renewed in 2016, reauthorized, I should say, in 2016. Uh, which is the, the law of our state for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The official target, which is likely to be changed by the General Assembly uh, in 2022, the official target is a 40% reduction by 2030 and an 80 to 95% reduction by 2050. Um, it's widely expected that the General Assembly will uh, increase the, the, um, the interim target, the 2030 target, to at least a 50% reduction and create, uh, based on the Climate Commission's recommendation, a, a new target of net zero emissions statewide by 2045, which would put Maryland on um, the leading edge of states in the US on, on climate action goals. Uh, important to note, there's a big difference between a goal and the achievement of that goal. Uh, so everything I'm about to say about the plan should be taken with the very large grain of salt that it is a plan and we must enact the measures to actually achieve the measures in the plan. So the GGRA plan, uh, which was published earlier this year by MDE with uh, buy-in from uh, Governor Hogan and, and the state agencies, charts a path to reducing emissions about 50% by 2030, um, exceeding the 40% goal. It'll be updated uh, eventually to chart a path to net zero by 2045 once the General Assembly officially confirms that as our goal. But I should tell you that internally we're already working toward that goal because we, we assume that it's coming down the pike. On electricity consumption, I wanna hit just three major buckets of, of uh, sort of mitigation strategies within um, the GGRA plan. So starting with electricity consumption, uh, Electricity used to be the largest sector of greenhouse gas emissions for the state. Um, that, uh, that's no longer the case because electricity emissions are half of today of what they were in 2006. So there's been a dramatic decrease in emissions as uh, we've shifted from coal-fired uh, power plants. There's been a, a number of retirements of coal-fired power plants, uh, including recently, and of course, a shift to renewable energy. The state's policy is that we achieve 50% renewable 
uh, electricity by 2030. That's the renewable portfolio standard um, uh, rule. And this is also the state's policy that we achieve 100% clean electricity by 2040. Important to note though, that the Biden administration has a goal to reach 100% clean electricity nationwide by 2035. So depending on federal action, we might actually have a strong federal wind behind our sail that could um, encourage the state to accelerate its clean energy goal. So shifting to transportation, and, and it's, it's also, I should point out, very important to start with the conversation here with electricity because the shift to clean electricity is the backbone of the rest of the decarbonization strategy. And, and that'll be apparent to you if it's not already in just a second. So on transportation, transportation is currently the largest source of emissions in, within the state. The vast majority of those emissions are, are coming from the consumption of, of gasoline uh, for, of course, gasoline powered vehicles. So we're, we're, when we're, we're talking about transportation, in, in this case, it includes all forms of transportation, airplanes, um, heavy shipping, uh, the, the port of Baltimore, like all of that is included in, in transportation. Um, and yet uh, gasoline powered cars very clearly far and ahead are the driver of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. So the goal here, uh, pretty simply, is to, of course, encourage alternative transportation options, encourage mass transit, but also electrify practically all vehicles, including cars, trucks, buses, and possibly even ships and airplanes uh, by the middle of the century. So there's a major, major initiative uh, globally to electrify the transportation sector. Um, and that theme of electrification is what I, you know, it's important to keep with you as, as we carry into the next topic, which is buildings. So the strategy is very similar for buildings. Uh, direct fuel usage in buildings, as in the natural gas, heating oil, and propane that we consume typically for space heating and water heating, is the third largest source of emissions in the state, but it's on track to becoming the second largest source uh, later this decade as the electricity grid continues to get cleaner and cleaner. Um, the goal for buildings is the same for transportation, which is electrification. The GGRA plan calls for replacing fuel burning equipment, especially, especially space heaters and water heaters with electric heat pumps, either air source or ground source. Um, if you're not familiar with a heat pump, uh, but perhaps you're familiar with an air conditioning system. Uh, a heat pump is the same thing. It's just that you can reverse the cycle so that whereas an air conditioner is moving heat from inside of your home to outside of the home, a heat pump just is able to reverse that cycle to move heat that is in the ambient air outside into your home. Uh, century old technology uh, perhaps some of you are, are heating your homes currently uh, with heat pumps. Um, ground source heat pumps are also commonly referred to as geothermal systems. Um, so those, those are the two very common systems. They're already the second most common heating system in Maryland. So this is almost certainly a technology that some of you are using already in your own homes. Um, the Maryland Commission on Climate Change just earlier this week published, along with its annual report, a building energy transition plan, which calls on the General Assembly to enact specific measures for decarbonizing buildings. Some of those measures include uh, calling for an all electric new construction code. This basically means that every new building, be it a home, uh, a business, uh, one of our state owned buildings, should be built to be all electric. That means that we should not uh, be using installing with you know by the middle of this century or the middle of this decade uh, fossil fuel burning equipment in new buildings because the modeling shows that building an all-electric uh, home for instance is lower cost to build and lower cost to operate than a home built with um, fossil fuel heating equipment so it's that this is oftentimes the low cost solution uh, for both construction and ownership uh, Another of those strategies um, or calls for the General Assembly to take additional action on building decarbonization is to offer greater funding to help owners of existing buildings, homeowners, business owners, uh, upgrade equipment to heat pumps. Um, also, I want to point out that the, the Build Back Better um, 
bill that the, the budget reconciliation bill that's in Congress would offer uh, pretty substantial electrification rebates uh, to the to, for, for low income homes. Um, it's upwards of 100% of the cost of electrification upgrades for low income households. And uh, for non low income households, it's, I think, up to 50% of the total installed costs for electrification upgrades. And electrification in, in, in this sense, in terms of this congressional bill, is inclusive of upgrades to a home to accommodate an electric vehicle charger, uh, upgrading your water heater to be a, uh, an electric water heater, um, installing that heat pump for efficient heating and cooling of your home. Uh, so it's 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 pretty comprehensive in terms of the electrification upgrades that are that are that uh, Congress is hopefully going to approve. Um, uh, third on this list of four things that I want to point out about the building energy transition plan, it calls on the General Assembly to create something called a building emission standard to guide existing commercial and multifamily buildings to achieve net zero emissions by 2040. This is a flexible technology neutral path that, that just creates a target for, the, for commercial multifamily buildings and additional financial incentives to see that those building owners are able to implement the uh, technologies to achieve uh, the reduction in direct greenhouse gas emissions from their buildings. And then finally, it requires, uh, I shouldn't say finally, but, but last on the list of four things that I wanted to share with you tonight, uh, the, the plan calls for requiring the electric and gas utilities uh, providing service to our state uh, to develop transition plans for achieving a highly electrified building sector. Those are actually just four of the more than 50 recommendations that the Climate Commission uh, approved earlier this month and just published in its annual report uh, earlier this week. So I encourage you to check out that report if you haven't already, again, this is what I'm referring to is the Maryland Commission on Climate Change uh, and its annual report, which was just released. Um, so that is my quick overview of, of state action, state level action to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. I, I, I did not touch on adaptation and resiliency, incredibly important topics. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to attempt to address some of those issues uh, in our Q&A that we're about to enter, uh, but just know that M MDE takes lead, my agency takes lead on greenhouse gas emissions reduction, and it's Maryland DNR that takes lead on adaptation and resiliency. So some of your questions on adaptation, I might need to refer to DNR. Um, uh, also, just one, one final note, um, I just wanna acknowledge the leadership from Montgomery County and Prince George's County on climate action. Um, the leadership that's emerged from some of the, the local munis the municipalities within those counties, but then also at the county level. I mean, Montgomery County has a remarkably ambitious uh, climate plan. Um, I don't actually don't know where in the process Prince George's County is. I know that they were going through a process um, to develop a climate plan. Perhaps that's wrapped up now. Um, so, um, the, the state would not be able to make the, the um, statewide um, progress that it's making and planning on making without the leadership from some of our more progressive counties. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Dr. Stewart, do you want to include a link to that document in chat? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll pull it up as we, uh, as we do Q and A here. Thank you. And I saw um, Amanda Dewey noted that the there's a public comment period on the Prince George's County climate plan that goes through December 1st. Oh, great. Good to know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if anyone has a question, if you would raise your hand or you can put it in chat, uh, either way, if you want to speak, raise your hand. If you want to just, if you want me to ask it for you, put it in chat and we'll do that. I did have a question to start. Um, well, it's a two-part question. One is, um, when you think about the municipalities, what are the top things that you think that could um, have the most benefit of focus for reducing greenhouse gas and emissions? Um, that's one, because many of us are working through pieces of uh, code and legislation that will help support climate action plan. And the second yeah, part is, sure. is, there, is there something that, is there anything that's happening at the state level in terms of grants or things that are coming through in the infrastructure uh, bill that you anticipate that might be available for municipalities to help 
advance our goals? Uh, I'll address the second question first because that's the easier one. Uh, the answer is I don't know, um, but um, but that's that's a very important question that's that's been floating around in my group too. So I, I hope to get the answer to that um, soon. That's that's really critical. Um, on the first one, um, you know, uh, again, I think a lot about vehicle electrification and building electrification, and I think to, to you know. That brings to mind at least a couple of things. One is on vehicle electrification. Um, cities, towns, um, pla places where we have residences that don't have um, uh, off-street parking have a have a real challenge in figuring out. You know what is the, what's the at-home charging solution for electric vehicles? Uh, this is an issue, and I know that uh, Patrick Wohan is a is a transportation expert, so he can probably educate me on on what the solution there is for EV charging but but you know establishing the the infrastructure for EV charging is um, is certainly a, a challenge that can be addressed very well I think at, at the local level um, and then on building electrification I just recently learned from one of my former colleagues about a new program that Tacoma Park initiated to uh, help uh, provide additional incentives for heat pump adoption. Um, and I, you know, I think that the, the Tacoma Park program could be a great example of, of ways uh, that, that uh, towns and cities can help accelerate the transition to um, replacing fossil fuel equipment in homes with, with electric alternatives. Okay, I think we have a, a question. Xander Harcourt has yes, a question. Yes, Commissioner Harcourt. Hi, thank you, and I uh, appreciate you being here. Um, our uh, community, I'm, I'm actually reaching out to uh, county um, level um, people who can help us with some type of programming to increase our tree canopy uh, to, you know, help cool and clean the air. In our community, we had some um, illness with a lot of trees and they had to take them out. Um, but our areas, in most uh, communities like mine, generally don't have a substantial tree canopy. Uh, and we're also dealing with like a lot of groundwater and stormwater issues. Is there anything that the state or any type of programs that are available? Because a lot of the roots that I'm, I would like to have trees planted, the county is saying those are state uh, roads and those types of things. But are there programs where the state can help us uh, go ahead and put trees in here uh, and so we can do our part with increasing our tree canopy. Yeah, one of the things, one of the, the great pieces of legislation that passed just last session um, was the Tree Solutions Now Act uh, sponsored by Senator Pinsky, um, which uh, pledges to plant um, 12 million trees in, in the state by 2031. Um, and uh, there's you know significant uh, funding and, and coordination behind that. Um, that is that is actually sort of in, on the implementation side being coordinated between MDE and, and DNR, and that's very active right now in terms of being rolled out. So I don't have great answers for, for you in terms of tapping into those resources, but those are going to be some pretty substantial resources to to um, incentivize and encourage tree planting um, uh, statewide within this decade. Um, so I will, let me reach out to my colleague who's, who's taking lead on that and see if I can get more information uh, for this group on uh, how to take advantage of at least that program. And I'll also ask if there are other programs that perhaps aren't coming to my mind right now that are available uh, to you. And of course, I, seeing the network of folks who are here, others might have a, a good answer to your question that I don't have. Thank you, uh, Council Member Bartram. Hi, yeah, no, thank you for, for coming here. I, I, I guess I come to this as somewhat of a skeptic um, because I, I see what happened to the third unit proposed for Calvert Cliffs. I see what happened to Great Bay Wind for in the Chesapeake Bay. And, and so that's on the, you know, the reduction side and then I see, I mean, you have personal experience with what happened in Ellicott City. And, and I guess at some point, knowing that we in Maryland are less than 0.1% of the world's population, 
that we really ought to be focusing not so much on reducing, but on adaptation and resiliency. And, and in Kensington, like most jurist municipalities around the area, I'm sure we have problems with stormwater systems. And, and it just seems like at some point we have to acknowledge reality that um, you know, we aren't going to be able to go it alone. We can, we can certainly do our part, but the more pressing concerns are the immediate uh, resiliency efforts that we ought to be supporting. So, I, and I know that you said that that's not your, your focus. Your focus is more on the um, reduction, but I, 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 just to throw out a number, I think we ought to be putting maybe like 5% towards reducing emissions and 95% and towards um, adaptation because we're not going to be able to convince China, India, and Indonesia to forego the um, the, the development and, and the um, yeah, electrification of, of their own systems to get air conditioning and refrigeration that we already have. It's hard to disagree with you fully considering the outcome of the United Nations Co Conference COP26 that there's a lot of progress that still needs to be made in having uh, the world's largest emitters, uh, including China and India, but also, of course, the United States, um, have commitments and plans and actions to back up all those things uh, that, that rise to the challenge. Um, I, you know, I, I see it as needing to fight every, every front here. Um, and I understand that at the end of the day, that looks like decisions on resource allocation. Um, so to your point, you know, I, I don't have an answer to what's the appropriate allocation of the fixed resources that, that we have on uh, pressing on mitigation versus pressing on adaptation and resilience. From, from my standpoint, we've got to prioritize investments on all these things. Um, the more I, adaptation and resilience, absolutely critical to, to put investments toward. Uh, but if we also, if we back off of our mitigation in Maryland and in the United States, so will the rest of the world. Um, and our mitigation and adaptation challenges will only increase if that happens. So it's, it, it's an all in strategy. I think many of us appreciate that comment because we all know that U.S. is also a big driver on consumer products because we have purchasing power. And uh, if they want our money, then they will maybe produce more of the products that we want to consume and hopefully use it at home eventually. But I, I, I think it's a good point that um, it, this is a small corner of the world, but it, we, we can lead by example and push through our purchasing as well. Um, I did see another question request from um, from somebody, but I did want to ask one quick question ahead of time. You talked about EV infrastructure. Um, two questions on that. One, how many EVs are in Maryland? And two, many other states, uh, well, I'll send it many, but like if you travel along New Jersey, for example, you can be pretty sure you're going to find EV plug-in opportunities. Um, it, that, that does not feel the same experience throughout Maryland. And so if we're going to encourage people to get EV, we have to help reduce the driver range anxiety. So what is Maryland doing on that regard? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of new investment, both, both state and federal going into um, <clears throat> roadside fast chargers. Um, though, I mean, go, circling back on, on my uh, comment earlier, I, I think that the I think that the at home charging is, is a is a bigger issue to, to have to drive. There's a lot of there's a lot of dollars going into <laughs> the charging network, um, uh, but if people don't have a place to charge at home, and for for reasons that I can't get into right now for for the sake of time, there are many 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 grid resiliency benefits uh, to having that car charging overnight and even being able to back feed power. Uh, at times when the grid needs it to the home, to, to the grid, if there's a power outage, like that's part of this ecosystem. But we've got to figure out how to uh, facilitate the ability for people who, who live um, uh, in places where there is no plug-in opportunity overnight at home to be able to do so. That, so for me, that's the bigger infrastructure challenge. 
Uh, Monique, I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, Patrick Wohan and Robin Barr have questions. Yes, please go for it. Uh, Rob, uh, Patrick, do you want to go first? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you uh, for the presentation. This is really informative, uh, Dr. Stewart. And um, um, the uh, question I have, speaking of going all in, um, on that we need all strategies at, at once here. Um, the focus on in the transportation sector uh, seems to be you know, really, really on on electric vehicles, which is important. But uh, but but it's I think there's a growing understanding that it's not adequate. That we really also need to be uh, focused on mode shift. That we need to be focused on smart growth. Um, that uh, if you um, you're not going to make everybody drive an electric vehicle t tomorrow. Uh, um, so that that transition is only going to take place over time. Um, my one thing I don't understand is is uh, the uh, extent to which the Maryland Department of the Environment is coordinating with MDOT uh, with local planning agencies to to make sure that that happens that we that um, we are really taking uh, carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions into account when we're considering plans for development plans for um, uh, for investment in infrastructure, uh, transit, biking, walking, um, that's not carbon based. Uh, so can you, can you talk more, more about that? And, and what is, where, where are those strategies here? Yeah, I, I genuinely wish I could, um, you know, frankly, in my three months at MDE, I haven't gotten enough insight to the collaboration, uh, with MDOT. I, in my interactions with, with MDOT, um, and some of their, you know, climate-focused staff. It, it, it seems that they are they they have this very firmly um, uh, in front of them on their on their radar and is incorporated into their strategies. But but I I, I I'm in no position to speak for MDOT, and I and I'm not yet in a position to know truly the answer to your question in terms of MDE MDOT coordination on these things. Thank you, Council Member. Thanks, Dr. Barr. Yeah, sir, you're muted. Polly, can you unmute him, please? All right. Um, this is about research and it's state offering research funds under this thing, like for things like direct carbon capture and storage or other ways of taking carbon out of the air or resiliency for that matter. Is there any money going that way? That's a good question that I should actually know the answer to because of my former role at the university. Um, and in, in terms of state dollars going into those research activities, um, you know, so so much of the research that's happening in our in our research labs is federally funded. Um, there's state support for things like the Maryland Clean Energy Center. And the um, the Maryland Energy Innovation Institute, but when you track down to are there are there dollars flowing into actual research projects? The truth, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. And I see a, a, another question here in the chat: Is Pepco and the other uh, Maryland utilities scaled up? To the demand for all of this electrification? Very important question. Um, so our modeling shows that electrification actually is likely to have just about zero grid impact through the 2020s. The impact starts to happen in the 2030s and, and um, by the end of the 2030s and into the 2040s it becomes much more important that the infrastructure is in place to accommodate these levels of electrification. For the most part for the, for the foreseeable future for the next 10 years or so, uh, the increased load from electrification is pretty much offset by increased energy efficiency um, through Empower Maryland and, and other programs. So it's fairly level for, for the next decade, according to the models. Um, uh, Pepco, BGE, others are, are obviously very well aware of, of the move toward electrification, um, uh, especially Pepco. 
Uh, DC has an electrification, but you know the DC has a net zero emissions plan, uh, a plan for building and vehicle electrification. Uh, Pepco has been working on that um, for a while now. But uh, one of the reasons that it's our recommendation that the PSC require the utilities to develop transition plans is to ensure that this is done in a structured way so that the electric utilities have solid plans for the build out of the infrastructure that would be needed to accommodate this increased level of electrification. Um, and also very importantly, that the gas utilities have a structured transition plan to accommodate uh, what is a, essentially inevitably a decrease in total gas throughput in their system and a departure of gas customers from uh, the distribution system. And the, the risk that that poses in shifting distribution costs onto the remaining gas customers. Uh, so there's some, you know, equity and, and uh, just transition issues obviously rolled into that. Thank you. Uh, one, two last questions. Uh, one is when you do find out more information about um, the infrastructure bill and things that may be available to cities, will you be uh, willing to send us, proactively send us what you know, or just keep us in the loop uh, because sure. we want to know? And if there are any important things that you hear of at the state level that would benefit uh, the municipalities and our counties, we would appreciate the ongoing interaction with you, if that's possible. And then uh, I was, correction, Mayor uh, Wodeham made uh, a comment about just looking at other smart growth and, and transit. Uh, would love to just understand more in the future about Maryland's commitment to mass transit as well. Um, I know Montgomery County, PG County, we've, there's been a lot of discussion about highways and, you know, I understand that, but it just, we also yeah. care about mass transit and, and building near transit stations. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I would, I would almost certainly not be the one to, to come back to answer all of your transit questions. <laughs> have, to, have to be one of our partners at MDOT. Totally um, understand. Just want you to put pressure yeah. on them, please. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, so let me try to get info on, you know, funding for trees, what infrastructure bill funding means uh, in this lens for uh, local governments. Um, uh, and, yeah, and I will, I'll reach back out. Uh, I think my, my main contact is Holly here. So I think that I'll wind up reconnecting with Holly on those issues. Thank you very much. DNR has, DNR has uh, tree programs, the Maryland Tremendous Program. I think DNR has more planting programs that municipalities may be able to tie into. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. And, and Welcome. It sounds like you have recently, you know, joined, but hit the ground running. And uh, what you do matters to all of us. So we wish you well. Well, and and thank you for the promotion. Um, I don't I don't have a doctor. Oh, I see but... MND at the MD at the back of your name there. Oh, that's I, I was on the call earlier, and, and they asked us to put maybe our just Maryland. On. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm certainly <laughs> not that Maryland. sort of doctor. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. no. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Take care. All right, so uh, we're gonna have our next speaker talk about what's going on on redistricting. And so I'd like to welcome Dr. Kathleen Hetherington. Uh, she's the former president of the Howard Community College and the member of the State Redistricting Commission. Welcome. Thank you so much, Monique. It's a pleasure to see everyone tonight or all those folks that I can see. Um, we have a, a nice crowd here tonight. Um, it's an honor to speak with you and I'm going to try and put almost a year's worth of work in uh, 20 minutes. Uh, but uh, just so you know that a lot of what I'll be covering tonight is available on the web under redistrictingmaryland.gov. So a little bit background about me. I am the recently retired president of Howard Community College. I uh, was president for 14 years and worked at the college for 22 years. And uh, it's uh, when I heard Mark talk about Ellicott City and the flood flooding. Um, you know, I know firsthand what people have gone through and the commitment of people in Howard County to help support all those people that um, uh, suffered in those two tragedies that we had. So it was uh, interesting for me just to hear his presentation. So I'm gonna be talking tonight 
about the um, redistricting. Uh, and there's it's a lot in the news a lot these days. And it's in the news, not just in Maryland, but across the country. So, well, what what the heck is it? You're probably saying, what is redistricting? Some of you may be familiar with it, but I have to tell you, for um, most of the people who served on the redistricting commission, we were new to the topic and uh, we, we learned quickly about it. So it's used to define the process by which a new congressional and state legislative district boundaries or lines are drawn. And it's a rebalancing based on changes in the population. Uh, and this happens every 10 years after the completion of the United States Census, which was done in 2020. Uh, the process of the U.S. Census Bureau delivering the census data to the states was delayed um, during, from the spring when we were supposed to have it. It was released in late August, and it was posted to the website uh, um, that I just uh, mentioned. Um, in Maryland, inmates in Maryland prisons or counted at their last known address. So that also had that data had to be adjusted to reflect that. And we received that data in uh, around the end of August, early September. So um, once we that final data is adjusted, the drawing of the boundaries based on uh, population was able to get started. So how you're represented in Washington, DC and Annapolis depends crucially on the redistricting process. And over the past decade, um, as I'm sure you've experienced in both your counties, some areas have gained population and some areas have lost population. And the census provides detailed data that shows how many people live in each specific area of the state. So um, often we're asked, well, what does apportionment or reapportionment mean and how does it work? Well, reapportionment is the process by which each state is allowed allotted a, a certain number of Congress people in the House of Representative, uh, Representatives based on the population of the state. And Maryland currently has eight congressional districts, and this number did not change based on the apportionment total for the state, which was released by the Census Bureau back in April. And each con congressional district has to have substantially the same amount of people. So in Maryland, that means that we have to have 772,153 people per district. So a county or region, such as say the Eastern Shore or Western Maryland, that has less than that amount is going to have to reach that number by including people who live in other parts of the state. And in contrast, there are counties that have more than 772,153 people, as you all well know, and some areas of those counties will have to be in adjoining districts. So this commission was created by executive order and I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully everything will work as it's supposed to work. I can bring up my presentation. All right, so um, I wanna, First, before I go into this executive order um, that was issued, talk a little bit about the executive order. And um, our duties were to uh, comply with all state and federal constitutional legal requirements, including the Voter Rights Act. And um, I'm not gonna highlight everything, but just a few things. Uh, be a geographically compact, include nearby areas of popula uh, population to the extent practic uh, practical respect natural boundaries and the geographic integrity and continuity of any municipal corporation, county or other political subdivision to the extent practical. And what we weren't allowed to do, we, uh, it's in the executive order, it reads, we could not account for how individuals are registered to vote, how individuals voted in the past or the political party to which individuals belong or the domicile or residence of any individual, including an incumbent office holder or political candidate. So that was um, very much part of what we had to keep in mind. So just so you see back in January, that's when Governor Hogan issued his executive order and he formed the Maryland, Commission's, uh, Maryland Citizens Commission um, on redistricting. Uh, we were charged with uh, creating the congressional and legislative district lines. And we had a mix of uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents. The three co-chairs, there was one Democrat, one Republican, one independent. And then we had to choose from over um, 400 applications, the um, other uh, six people who would serve on our commission. 
And we try to, in doing that, have a, um, a representation of uh, different counties throughout the state to the extent possible that you can do with six people. And um, one of the most important things, and I think the thing that we're very proud of is that we wanted to make sure that the process was totally transparent. So everyone who wanted to see the work that we were doing could, and they could engage in the process. So our public meetings began on May the 5th, and we had a number of uh, meetings among the commission members just to dis uh, discuss process. And um, those meetings were made available to the public. So the public wasn't necessarily testifying during that period of time, but they could see the discussions that we were having. So we had three rounds and the first one was held on uh, June 9th through the 28th of July. And they included eight regional meetings and the public was able to come in and share their thoughts and concerns regarding redistricting in advance of the census data that was released. Uh, and I uh, talked about the constraints that we had with the late arrival of that, that data. Not only were they able to do it publicly if they wanted to testify, but people could also submit written testimony or they could um, come into the chat, which many people did. So then following that, we had round two, they went through most of the month of September. And for the most part, our meetings were held on um, Wednesday evenings at six o'clock. And they would go from six to seven, sometimes eight, sometimes 8.30. Uh, and we always made sure that um, people had to sign up in advance, but if someone wanted to uh, sign up that night, they could sign up uh, via the chat and we would admit them into um, the, uh, the presentation so that they could give their presentation. So round two, that's when we had four statewide virtual meetings. And um, this is when uh, Marylanders could submit their own maps and also present them to us with live testimony. And also we had many maps coming to us, I'll give you the data in a minute, with written testimony and maps. So they were able to do their own map submissions. And during round two, we received 70 citizen map submissions, which was pretty impressive. And every single um, map was reviewed by members of the commission, was posted on the website so anybody could comment and they could see what we, um, we were seeing and as well as the, the written submissions. And then in addition to these public hearings, the commission also held uh, six public working sessions during the month of September to um, work on drafting the maps for the public to review and comment on. And we had to keep in mind, as I mentioned, the Voting Rights Act and the American, and we, and we were so lucky to have Professor um, Persley from Stanford Law uh, assisting us uh, for making sure that we were complying with the Voter Rights Act. And uh, as I said, he's a nationally known expert. So then we moved into round three and we were mindful that we had to get our work done and submit this. Um, by early November to the governor. So I you know, have to commend the people who worked on the commission because it was, you know, the majority of uh, us were working during this time. Uh, and we were doing this in addition to our day jobs. And um, so it was, it was challenging, but uh, the, the attendance was pretty much 100% at every single meeting from every single member. So then we moved into round three and these meetings were when the public could testify about the maps that we, the commission drew based on the information that we heard from the citizens of Maryland. So when you put them all together, we received 86 public map submissions uh, and we had a portal where people, people could submit it through the portal or email. And then um, we held these public working sessions so that people could um, observe um, what we had to do to make modifications to make sure we were in compliance with the Voter Rights Act, um, mindful of communities of interest and other matters that were related to district boundaries. We were very responsive to public reaction. And um, those of you, all of you who work with the public know that the public um, can be quite vocal and they were quite vocal. And uh, so we heard from Southeast Baltimore County, St. Mary's County, Towson area, Southern Montgomery County, and others 
asking us to make changes. And where possible, we certainly did do that. We also had questions um, asking us to address communities of interest in modifying the boundaries. So um, where this came into, into being is in um, Baltimore County, where a section of that was connected to the Northwest section of um, Baltimore City. We started out with Baltimore City intact and then we had to make a, a modification uh, to that. So um, we try to, as much as possible, listen to the public. We are a citizens redistricting commission and where possible, we made those changes. And every time we made a change, we posted that to the website so that residents could see what we could do. Now, was everybody happy? No, not everybody was happy because there were restrictions that we had based on the numbers that we had to meet. Um, we also had another meeting after round three to address additional modifications to make sure we were in compliance with the Voter Rights Act. And Professor personally helped us um, to, you know, looking at the numbers and statistics to make sure that we did that. So what happened? Over uh, this period of time, we had um, over 4,000 people attending our public meetings. And you know, at first when we were setting this up, we didn't know what was happening with COVID and we were thinking, well, maybe we could do some of these virtually. Um, I mean, in person rather than virtually, but I think um, there were many positive aspects to having this virtually because I think more people were able to participate because it was virtually uh, than would have happened if we had had public meetings. We heard from um, 231 separate testimony accounts and we had elected officials speaking, organizational leaders, members of the public. Uh, social media posts, as you can see here, over 100,000 impressions on Twitter, and we had a reach of more than 92,000. And every time we had a meeting, we sent out notification via press release to 46,000 contacts. We really wanted to make sure that the public was informed and uh, was able to participate. We also um, had our materials translated into Spanish and we had um, a Latina Hispanic advisor, Gloria Aparicio Blackwell, who is the founder and director of the University of Maryland Office of Community Engagement. She was a huge help. Every time we had meetings, she would um, send out the information to people in the Hispanic Latino uh, community. And all those, uh, we also had a live Spanish translation going on and we had closed captioning for the hearing impaired and we were um, working with the University of Maryland um, Spanish department for the, uh, the live translations during the meetings. So um, what happened is the amount of people, um, it's not in each of these con congressional state senate or legislative districts, it's not random. As I mentioned before, it's based on census data which indicates how many should be in each. And um, when you can, you can have a small percentage difference in the Senate and legislative districts, but you can't with congressional. They are, you know, as I mentioned before, that 772,000 number. So I think we spent more time than um, we would ever anticipate discussing single versus multi-member legislative districts. And we heard from the public on both sides of this issue. Some people liked multi-member districts, some people didn't. The executive order actually had asked us to include single member districts to the extent possible. Um, and we did that where we could, but we couldn't always do that. So to move forward with this, we came to a compromise that we would um, have, um, we would always take into consideration the Voter Rights Act, um, which as uh, if you don't know, um, you can find out more information online, but it protects racial language minority groups from vote dilution. Um, so here's what came into play with the single versus multi-member district. Um, we drafted the boundary lines with proper consideration of the Voter Rights Act and its impact on the communities and all Marylanders in them really was of uh, utmost importance to us. And that's why we spent so much time having this discussion. And um, I think what we eventually came up with, and these, these are marked draft, but the actual maps that we submitted to uh, Governor Hogan uh, on November uh, 5th, uh, they are available um, for viewing 
on, and this is this is the final one uh, on the legislative. They're they're available for viewing on the website. So what happens next? So it says tonight, which really is not tonight. Uh, this is um, maps were held for the commission to vote on, which we did. We presented them to Governor Hogan. Um, they are, the maps, as I mentioned, are posted. And then um, once it's done, this legislation has to be drafted in the form of a bill that will be presented to the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, a congressional bill will be introduced during the, uh, there's an, uh, so, a special session that will be held in December. And then the legislative bill will be introduced on the first day of the regular session. And then it goes through the legislative process. And a vote on the congressional bill will occur before the end of the special session in December, while a vote on the legislative bill has to occur before the 45th day of the session. Otherwise, the governor's bill becomes law. Um, many of you are aware that there is another commission, the second commission that was formed by members of the Maryland General Assembly. They are um, working on their maps as well. They have so far, um, as of yesterday at least, uh, submitted congressional maps for them for the public to comment on. Um, so they go through, they're going through a process. Um, uh, I haven't seen their Senate or their delegate maps yet, but they also will be going through a process. Um, so one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about with the legislative process. Um, you know, the, here's all the details regarding it, but basically the General Assembly can ignore all the work that our uh, commission has done, um, but they can't act on a plan until the governor submits one. And that's why this process, well, the governor has to submit his and then the General Your Assembly- call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Um, I think we have somebody, um, maybe wants to mute. So here's what we, we accomplished. Um, we uh, were able to um, have minimal splits of counties and municipalities. We, um, it's pretty straightforward, these congressional districts. Uh, we have a lower variance that then exists currently in some, which are now 5% plus or minus. And what we did with ours, uh, the maps that we worked on, we had a variance of plus or minus 2% for the Senate districts and um, plus or minus 3% for the delegate districts. Um, we were very responsive to the public reaction. Um, and, you know, I mentioned that we, we revamped the maps based on what we heard from um, a number of uh, Maryland citizens. And we have received an A for partisan fairness from the Princeton Gerrymandering Project which is a nonpartisan organization for the draft proposed congressional and Senate maps. Uh, I found out that they won't be reviewing the delegate maps because uh, they, um, they have, if I understand it correctly, they don't have a standard for delegate maps, but they do for congressional and Senate. So um, right now we're working on the final report and um, our commission members are participating in that. Um, I mentioned these are the folks that were involved and I mentioned them already. And I wanted to highlight these are the people who served on the commission. They were from Baltimore City, Baltimore County, uh, the Eastern Shore, Montgomery County, Jonathan Fussfield was from Montgomery County. Um, I mentioned I was from Our, uh, Howard County, Frederick, Prince George's, Judge Williams. Some of you may know Judge Williams from um, Prince George's County. So it was, um, pretty good representative group, as much as you can have with nine people. So um, the uh, we'll see what happens. It's, it's really up to the legislators now. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know there's been much in the news about this. Uh, so um, do you have a sense of how this will change uh, districts that are, you know, politically, I, that's, that's what I know I've been hearing and I've heard concerns about, uh, about potential drawing of maps based on trying to change um, that. So I, I did also see the, the, Merrill, the, the Princeton gerrymandering, gerrymandering project, excuse me. Um, so just wanted to give a sense of um, what your thoughts on, on those, some of those perspectives that have come out in the news. 
Well, um, as I mentioned, with uh, under the executive order from the governor, we, we couldn't account for anything that had to do with um, how individuals registered, um, how people voted, political parties. We, you know, for the most part, we didn't even know. I mean, you, you might know if you lived in a county, but um, generally we didn't have that in, in uh, any of our conversations. It wasn't part of what we were doing. So um, what happens at the end of all this will really be up to the General Assembly. So I, I don't know. There's a question in chat. Can you highlight the differences between your congressional map and the General Assembly Commission map? Yes, I think the best way to do that is that um, we have um, the final map that we have and they have four, four variations of that. So the best way is for you as an individual to go in and take a look at them because you're, they don't have a, a final one yet, so. The, um, the, con the commission's vote unanimous, that's another question that's come up. The only um, uh, time when we were voting on the maps, the uh, Senate maps were unanimous for approval by the commission members. The, de the uh, delegate maps were unanimously approved. Uh, we had one abstention, not abstention, but one person who didn't, um, uh, and this was um, uh, our commissioner from Baltimore City. And that was on the congressional. And um, the night we were voting, he said, you know, I just don't feel like enough people from Baltimore City have weighed in. Now, this was Commissioner Thomas have weighed in um, on the, the maps. So he said, I'm not going to vote in support of it. He didn't feel comfortable. So um, that was the only time we had anybody who of, of the group of the commission. We have a question, is there a minority report or a dissent? I think you covered the last part of that. Yeah, that, that was the only um, you know, vote that we had that was different. And it was because he felt like he didn't, he didn't feel comfortable voting um, as a Baltimore City resident uh, without having as much input as he had hoped for. And that's why he voted differently. But other than that, it was unanimous support of both of the, uh, the other maps, the Senate and the uh, delegate maps. I would strongly encourage anyone who's interested, all, all of my, what I just said, the presentation, everything um, is on the registering.maryland.gov website. It's, it's pretty interesting work. And uh, for those of us on the commission who had um, really no experience in this, it was um, really encouraging to see the civility in which this was this process was conducted because in some states, the commissions have been, they've abandoned it. They couldn't come to any consensus. They couldn't um, work together to come to any kind of conclusion. And I will say that the members of the commission acted in a very collegial manner, manner and we were very open and transparent and really um, clamoring to hear from the citizens of Maryland on this process. So we feel like we really did respond to the citizens. It's, as I said, not everybody is happy, but in terms of what we've come up with on, on, um, on, uh, through consensus, it was a very democratic process and really made you proud to, to be in Maryland and, and be part of this process and, be, and see so many hundreds of um, Marylanders and Bob. I see a hand raised by Darren Bartram. Mr. Bartram. I'm gonna sort of, um, go from that other question raised in the chat and, and say that I think if you look at the four proposed maps from the legislature, um, you'll see that it, they basically started with the existing districts and tweaked them according to the you know, population changes. Whereas my sense is you guys started from the ground up. You we did. You cast aside everything except binding laws like the Voting Rights Act and, and um, came up with something that when I looked at it first, I thought, oh my gosh, this is what, you know, non-gerrymandered districts look like. And, and so, and, and that's in contrast to the current maps, which, you know, get awards for being some of the most gerrymandered districts in the country, like um, districts two, three, and four. 
Um, and, and so when I look at the legislative proposals, they're, they're tweaks of that. And, and they're still like, the shape is just unnatural. And, and so I, I, I applaud your effort because I, I didn't know that it was possible to sort of come up with compact districts that, that complied with the various uh, legal requirements. So we'll, well see where it goes. You. Like, um, I, I, I think you guys did a, an amazing effort. Thank you. It was, I have to admit, it was literally hundreds of hours spent and we we're all volunteers, you know, as I said, and um, we were fortunate to have an expert in um, Professor Priscilla, personally from Stanford, helping us to make sure we were in compliance. But it was, uh, was a really interesting process and it, it gave you faith in um, Marylanders and their commitment. And I'm not just talking about the commission members, I'm talking about Marylanders who were, who had a vested interest in this process. So I'm, I'm proud of the work that Maryland, Maryland citizens did. Thank you. And thank you for your volunteerism and all the work and hours you put into this. Is there any take home for municipalities that you think we should know and, and educate our residents about? Well, I think for the common person, they don't even know anything about redistricting. I mean, I, I'll admit, I knew very little myself. I mean, I had heard of it and Voters Rights Act, but I wasn't thinking of Voter Rights Act in terms of, um, you know, redistricting. But it's, it's a learning process, but it's so important because, you know, who you're going to be able to vote for um, is going to be determined by what happens with uh, this redistricting. So I would hope that um, folks would pay attention to and, and give input into the, the legislative district because people still can uh, give input there. And I, I do think if um, people continue to do that, um, I think um, you know, we'll wind up with something that will be um, better than what we currently have. I'm hopeful for that anyway. Is there a way that uh, folks can sign up for updates? The best thing is for, for our VAT, well, we're, our work is basically done in terms of the submission. But um, I would suggest that you look at the Maryland redistricting, Mar, redistricting.maryland.gov website um, for information about that. Updates is whether or not the status is, I, I assume, uh, would be provided um, by the governor's office or the, um, the office of planning. Office of planning did the administrative work for us, like setting up the Zoom meetings and that sort of thing. So I think through the office of planning, they would have updates there. And then just look at the news. I mean, it's going. this is going to really be news uh, in December. Um, after following that the special session to see what happens there and then uh, what happens during the, the general session. That's where I get most of my updates now. I just look at the news every day and see what's going on. <laughs> thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions and I just want to thank you for joining us for another volunteer hour. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it and uh, thank you for all the good work that you do for the counties. It's amazing the representation. I, I took a look at the membership and I was really impressed. So thank you for all the good work that all of you do. Good luck. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.